Hi, my name is Drew Krasowski. I'm a composer and orchestrator and sound designer. I've been in Los Angeles for the past 10 years now, and I love what I do. I went to, I attended Berklee College of Music, didn't actually graduate, which I think is okay. Once you know what you're doing, it's, it's okay to, especially in a creative field, um, it's okay to just go for it. So I, I went for the full four years, ran up the full four years of debt, also ran up the anger of my mother, was furious I didn't graduate, but we got over it and we're past it and we're here. I mean, with, with the stuff I've worked on, I feel like it's, it's pretty validated. I struggled so much when I got out here. Uh, the first few years of being out here was the hardest of my entire life. Um, there was everything from, I, I, I thought I had the idea that I was gonna come out here and blow everybody away with my music, that it would just speak for itself and had no idea that I had to speak for myself. <laughs> the whole networking thing was completely lost on me. I was terrible at it, really bad at it, still not great at it, but I can at least fake it a little better now. Um, yeah, so for the first four years or so, I was um, doing as many odd jobs as I could. I was doing dialogue editing. I did dialogue editing on Fallout New Vegas. I did as many little projects for friends and family as I could. I, I did a, a horror web series that actually used a lot of sound iron rust. That was one of the things that uh, got me through that project. It was primarily rust and rust ambiences. But there, were, there was a yoga album that I did. It's very relaxing meditation music. I worked at a toy store for three, four years, part-time. would work there during the day and then come home, write all through the night, get whatever projects I could get done. Do not be ashamed of getting a regular job. Regular job. It's whatever you can do to make your dream and your passion work, do it. You know, if you have to paint houses, paint houses. If you have to babysit or dog walk, do that. As long as it gives you the time to do what you want to do, as long as you feel like you're creatively fulfilled, do it until you don't have to anymore. Um, it, there's no shame in it. Everybody does it. <laughs> For networking, I'd say, don't think of it as much of, don't think of it as networking, as much as actually creating and maintaining meaningful relationships. These are people that you're going to work with a lot, hopefully. They're people that you want to have something in common with, or you want to have a connection with, so there's an understanding. The stronger your relationship with your clients is and the people you network with, the better your friendship will be, the better your dialogue will be, the more common ground you'll have and you'll have a vocabulary between the two of you or the eight of you, however many people are involved. You'll really get to dial in on what the project is and what it needs, and you'll, all do, the, you'll do that all together because nobody does any of this alone. Everybody has a team. Uh, I started working with Tim Williams as uh, just a general assistant. Um, I, I came out to Los Angeles a few months before I moved here and one of those days, I went to a studio, that uh, Igloo Studios in Burbank. My friend, I went to college with Nikolai Baxter, who's blown up, by the way. He's like a mixing engineer on La La Land. Justin Hurwitz gave Nikolai Baxter a shout out uh, when he won for First Man. So we, I went into the studio with him for one day. Tim happened to be recording that day. Um, it was really fun. It was for a kid's movie. It was called uh, Playmobil, The Secret of Skull Island way back in like 2009, I think, 2010, 2009. And we met, got along really well, I asked him if he needed help. I ended up being his first assistant, doing you know just general things. Uh, he actually taught me orchestration, and that has been something that has sustained me throughout my entire time in LA. Big piece of advice that I would strongly encourage every new composer coming out here is definitely diversify find something else in music that you enjoy because you may not find that composing lasts you the entire year. Your clients may not, I mean, usually clients don't have several projects going on at a time. It's one, it takes a few months, and then you're done. What do you do for the rest of the year? <laughs> you're not gonna survive off the $500 you made on a 30 minute short. You know, it's, you're gonna work for a lot less than you deserve at first, but that's okay. You're building a, re you're building a resume, you're building a portfolio. So diversify in those times in between. Um, that's actually why I got into sound design as well. Um, so with, with Tim Williams, he taught me orchestration. Ten years later, I'm still orchestrating with him and for him, working together with him. Um, sound design is something I kind of fell into on my own, though. 
There's a, a game developer I work for called Visor Interactive or Visor Games. They're based in Belarus and they do a, they started out doing Facebook games, but now they've gone mobile. They're working on a really big PC game coming out in the next couple of years. But one day they just asked, like they said, hey, do you do sound design? I said, no. <laughs> They said, well, that's a shame because we only need like five sounds for a little mini game that we're incorporating into this social network game. Do you think you could do that? I said, no. <laughs> they said, please, <laughs> because you charge less than our guys in Belarus and we like you. It's like, oh, okay, now that I know I, I charge less, maybe I need to rethink this. So I did the sound design for them. They really liked it and I really liked it. It was something I was terrified of that I didn't have any idea what to do about. So I, I never had any training in it. Everything has been watching videos and talking to other sound designers, see what they do. Um, learning as you go, big thing. Um, it may take a little bit of extra time, but in the end, it is so worth it to take that time to make the mistakes so that you don't make them again. So that's two skills that I never ever thought I would get into, orchestration and sound design, that ended up saving my life and giving me money to survive. <laughs> A massive challenge in my career was starting it. Just being able to get to a point where you can confidently do music 24-7, like all year long. It was the scariest point in my life, quitting that job at the toy store to do music full time. It was terrifying and I absolutely failed a couple times. I had to borrow money from friends to make rent, but I always paid it back. Sometimes it took a little bit longer, but you know, it's, it's terrifying, it is. Um, I didn't have anybody to support me. There's no family money, there's no, you know, sponsor anywhere. It's all on me. But that's also kind of, that is in itself the biggest win as well, because when you can do that, when you can come out from that, say, this is what I've built for myself, this is what I've done for me, there's no feeling like it. It's incredible. It's less of a favorite story, more of a, a fun little anecdote. I'm not gonna mention the composer or the project but there was, we were source connecting with choir with Bratislava, I believe. And you know, oftentimes it's too expensive to record in Los Angeles or London. So there are some really, really excellent orchestras. Prague is excellent. Um, Budapest is another really great one. South Africa, I hear, is also really viable, doing really well. But we had a source connect session with Bratislava using their brass and then their choir. And the choir, it, it, to be fair though, it was pretty gnarly stuff. It was very like clustery, aleatoric choir stuff where it's not supposed to sound good. And despite that, even though we needed some really crappy sounding kinds of things, this choir was just not cutting it. It was really bad. And the composer just lost his cool and fired them on the spot, walked out of the studio and we didn't see him again the rest of the day. But to his credit, they kind of had it coming. <laughs> Something I actually really like doing sound design wise. Um, I'll, I go out to, there's some caves in Bronson, Bronson Canyon out in LA, part of Griffith Park. Um, I took my girlfriend out one day to do some sound design recording. She helped me with some footsteps. She has tinier feet, so they were really excellent for different sound footsteps. We found this really cool cave, uh, one entrance in, and then it kind of splits into two, two exits. And we were recording there, and we hear this van pull up and just all of a sudden, like 20 people like slowly walking through. It was the most excruciating like six minutes trying to just like, I need to record, you're, you're in my, you please stop. But they ended up being a location scouting team for the show Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. So we didn't talk to them because I was a little bit upset that they were ruining my recording, but they were all really sweet, very nice. They're like, oh, what are you doing some recording? Yep. And, but they were all very kind and very sweet, so it was it was fun. Just, but that's that's Los Angeles. That happens everywhere. Regular day depends entirely on the project, as you can imagine. I tend to work really well at night, so I wake up usually between like ten and noon, which is great for some people. But uh, yeah, uh, I get calls from clients like eight, nine in the morning, and I have to be up for those. So. I've gotten really good at just being able to fake being awake, just picking up the phone like, hello. Yeah, hi. What's up? And that, I, 
gets fun. Anyways, yeah, so a typical day starts out waking up, obviously, depending on the project. If it's sound design, uh, you know, working from a home studio can get a little complicated when you have a busy street right outside your window. So sometimes waiting till the middle of the night is the best time to record. So I've, you know, got my gear. I have a Zoom H4n. It's kind of old by now, but it still works beautifully. I take that mic, go out into the front yard here, this little area, and just record a bunch of like stomping foot sounds in the grass or breaking twigs and stuff. Um, just kitchen sounds at night, like sawing really stale bread for sawing wood. It's it works really well. Sweet Potato Audio is my all-in-one audio team. I, I have it with my one of my closest friends, Amit May Cohen. She's a brilliant composer, um, really great orchestrator, but the services we offer, we do composition, orchestration, and sound design. Camera can, probably can't see this way down here, but that's okay. Um, but uh, yeah, so we do composition, orchestration, and sound design, and we've actually done quite a lot. We, we pull our resources together and we, we just finished a, a really great short film about domestic abuse called Cycle. Um, really powerful short film, like very visceral sound design in it. There was an idea of having a sound for a, a threatening sound and it's kind of, the, the story is kind of told in reverse so it's almost a bit like Memento that way where you see the end of it and then you go back in time and then at the very end you go to the actual end and it's the story of a little girl's perspective of her parents fighting and her mother being abused. So the sounds for that were pretty raw, pretty terrifying, um, very violent. Um, despite the subject matter though, it was actually really fun to do. Um, there were, this is awful, you never know what it's going to be like trying to record slaps or hits which is a very awkward thing to, to put yourself through. But there was one night we were recording together and we weren't slapping each other. Thank God, none of that. But we thought, okay, to simulate a slapping skin sound, I'm going to slap the inside of my leg. So I put shorts on and I just tried to like scrape the inside of my thigh. Bruised myself so badly, slapping myself for five minutes straight. And it didn't sound right at all. So we eventually just grabbed a belt and snapped the belt back. And that was what we ended up using. So I went through five minutes of intense pain just to use something else entirely. But that was fun regardless. I love world instruments. There's kalimbas, there are percussion instruments, dumbecks. Um, what is that one called? I can never remember, but it's a two-sided drum. It's a deeper head on the bottom, on the top and a smaller head on the bottom. Very different timbres. Um, there are metal tongue drums, there are a whole bunch of different world stringed instruments. I, anytime I can incorporate those into what I do, I do. I love recording live things. So that's another good piece of advice for new composers. Anytime you can do something live, do it. If you have a guitar, if you have an acoustic guitar and you can play it, record it live. It will sound so much better than trying to sample something. A lot of, live, a lot of places do really great samples, but don't rely on them when you don't have to. It'll, it'll, it's just a nice personal thing to give, your, to give it your own sound. Um, but yeah, anytime I can record with anything live, I will, absolutely. So things like what I have open now, there's a, a cue from a video game I did music for called Mahjong Treasure Quest. There's some live, I believe there's some live percussion on there. It was like 2014, I can't quite remember. It's a long time ago. The track I'm gonna show you is uh, it's from a game called Mahjong Treasure Quest, developed by Visor Games. Uh, but the, it started out as the, the first thing I actually wrote for it was kind of the, the main level thing when you're, you're... It's a Mahjong game, it's a matching game. So this is just the standard level. No immediate threat, no timed puzzles, just very relaxing. The, the, the goal was to make it very relaxing and very peaceful while you're doing something that can be stressful. And then you have these witch levels where the puzzles are timed, You're trying. your character is trying to get further and deeper into these caverns and you only have a certain amount of time to do it. So that's where some sound iron percussion comes in and totally just is amazing. It's, you'll hear it right off the top. But using that same motif, it just becomes a lot more tense.
So I started with, you know, as you can see, that motif, this kind of marimba type thing. And immediately I knew I needed something kind of to emulate a ticking clock. So I know that through the Cathedral of Junk and the bike spoke specifically, I've been using that for this horror thing I did a long time ago. And I just loved it. It just... This wonderful detuned bike spokes. It just, it's perfectly, it's this motor that just fits throughout the whole thing. Just a simple detuning, super simple EQ. I mean, this, this was at a point when I didn't have Isotope plugins, so I was still using a lot of, if not all of Logic's plugins. Um, I, I mean, it sounds great. It really, it does the job. Ends up being really cool. Um, there's also a really, I love detuning things. That's most of my processing, honestly. It's just getting really interesting, deep sound. Um, and then from the Rust library, actually, this this kind of makes the whole thing for me, I think. It's this really, it's um, from Rust 1, the brass rail. I pitched it up six steps and it just becomes this. It just adds, adds right into the bike spokes. Very ticky, very clocky, very tense. Um, yeah, I think also from the Cathedral of Junk, there was, there was a coin kind of thing. Yeah, I think so. There's just a... Using that almost like a finger symbol. Um, a little bit later, there's also from Rust, there's this bottle and chairs patch. It's supposed to act like an echo, but I actually programmed it in myself. Just because I thought it was kind of cool too. But in, in context, that ends up being this very... And it's not something you hear as much as you kind of feel it. Um, keeping in mind that all of these are played over an iPhone, and the iPhone speakers don't really get that detailed. But if you do put headphones on, you will hear it. Another Rust library was this Tower Bang. Um, I actually used the arpeggiator on that one to get this really cool kind of like. I just I loved that. And then towards the end, you just what did we do for this one? Yeah, you just put a, a high pass, low pass filter on it. Sorry, so that at the end it gets a little bit more. Sweep some frequencies a little bit as it fades out. But yeah, the, the percussion in this one, that was that was one of the most important things. It, it, this key would be nothing without that percussion. And it's all sound iron, without exception. And it's not because you're here. It's not because you're here, sound iron. It's because you're good. So this, this key was designed, written as a trailer cue very dark. Uh, it started out with this one patch, just, just, this is it. Just something like this, held forever. Okay, for 12 bars, that's not forever, especially in the film world, that's moderate. But everything kind of came from around that starting point. It's gonna be the very heart of this cue has some of my favorite sound iron sounds, and they're featured like so brutally in this, and I freaking love it how it comes out. Right here we've got some fountain wires and boulder dash from Iron Pack 3. Also using the Requiem Choir. Then we have some of the drip library coming in here, as well as ambience, I mean ambience. So Terminus from the Fountain Wires library is about to shine. Oh, and there it is again. And then at the end is actually an instrument that I designed through Logic's Sculpture um, plugin. The use of the Requiem libraries really, really makes this come alive, and I actually now that I'm listening to it, 
I might want to go back and add more towards the end again because it's just a really great sound when you have these kind of It's very light, very ethereal, and very creepy. Mm. Just really gorgeous. They just blend so well together. Then on these buildups, we have some drip ambiences and ambious one, the, the rictus pulse during this section. This drip drone is just so cool. <laughs> I'm one of those people who, I, I know it, it ends up taking longer, but I'm kind of against loops sometimes. Like, I know it's, oh, I did something interesting there. Cool, that's good to know. <laughs> what did I do? Oh, I, it was one of the parameters. Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I don't really like using loops. I like, I, there's this pride in creating your own thing. So I'm not big on using a lot of pre-made things, although in the TV world, that's absolutely necessary. The, the deadlines are like, you have to, you just can't get away with it. But when I have the time, I really like to do my own thing. And I love that this kind of sounds like it could be a loop. It sounds like it's been pre-processed and pre-compressed, but it's actually not. It's just great right out of the box. Like most of, most of the ambious things are actually really incredible right as they are, like I don't think, I didn't EQ it at all. I just, I had it exactly as it is and it fits right into my mix, it was great. The, the drip ambiences, I just put a compressor on it. It was just. You get it, yeah. <laughs> and then for the, the terminus stabs, I have two different tracks of that because I wanted to do different things. Had one pan to the left, one pan, one pan like hard left, one pan medium right, and there are different tremolo plugins on each one to give them some shape. And so this one, this one is pan medium right. I have a pitch shifter on it. Just oh, the mix is so low that oh, I remembered. Yeah, just had the pitch shifter set at just one semitone up, and automated the mix so that it kind of sounds like it bends a little bit. While the tremolo, what's the tremolo doing? It's a 16th note triplet. And I believe, yeah, it's just straight ahead from there. So. See how it kind of sounds like it's starting to bend up a little bit? Like. And then the other one, this one, yeah, it's 16th note triplets, just standard low, and that's panned hard left. So I'll turn that down so it doesn't blow away Craig on camera. <laughs> But together with these brass stabs and the strings and just everything all together just makes this cacophonous. It would not be what that is without that. It just brings this chaos element. I love that. It just, that's, that is the heart of this cue is those bits right there. Like the iron packs, like, my God, they are so powerful for what they are. Like they're these little, you know, $4 libraries or $5 libraries. They're brilliant. They're just, I heard the demos for it and I freaked out. I was like, I need this immediately. It just, these are the things that like, they're the things that actually make you feel like a real composer because it's not stuff that everybody uses. You know, it's not stuff that everybody has. It's not stuff that you can just go out and sample on your own. It takes a lot of time and a lot of thought. And the way that Sound Iron thinks of all these different articulations and, and the ways that sounds layer together, they're just, it's unreal. <laughs> this cue, totally weird, kind of experimental, just practicing my percussion and synth chops on this, like editing. Uh, we've got a lot of great sound iron stuff on here. We're using Ambius One, we're using Cathedral of Junk, using Frendo, using the Iron Throne, using Fountain Wires. Uh, it all, uh, it, I, I love it, it's so weird. so new that I haven't rendered anything to audio yet, so everything you hear, just about everything, is all just straight up MIDI. But Sound Iron is the whole base of this entire cue. It's all of the cool, creepy stuff. It's all, it's all Sound Iron. 
was actually the first things that I loaded up too. There's this really great sweeping EQ drum bit going on, but that wasn't the first thing that started this off. And then we actually take a little break from Sound Iron to do some live guitar and Mellotron. And we bring in Sound Iron a little bit back for this, this Defi drone from Cathedral of Junk. To write for yourself gives you a really good of idea of what works when you actually have a deadline to write under. So you can say, okay, I tried this before, it worked great, I'm going to use that same thing. So saving plugins is a great way to do that. Um, creating snapshots within contact of instruments, things you change within. Because I'm constantly changing parameters within the sound iron libraries when there's something to change or there's something to fiddle with i'm gonna mess with it <laughs> if there's a button to push i'm gonna push the button um <laughs> so saving snapshots is there's a whole folder i have just like full of snapshots um saves so much time 